and what's it about? So let's just crack on. You're a vet, you're a surgeon, you're a clinical director, you're on a clinical advisory committee for a very large corporate called IVC. You've mm-hmm. just done an MSc in musculoskeletal science. Do you want to add any more to your achievements? <laughs> No, I was actually having a day off and then you maybe do that. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. How a few things going on. Uh, I think same as you. I graduated 2001. Oh, cool, cool. No, uh, 2002. You're just a little oh, okay. Older. I'm older. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, you did your certificate in small animal surgery. Let me just get rid of the squeaky toy. She does it every time. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've got so, a bird behind me, so he might start squeaking at some point as well. So, um, yeah, that's him. Luna, Luna finds these and hides them, and it's almost like she knows. So, yeah, yeah you um, did your certificate in small animal surgery. So that's right. that was soft tissue and orthopedic? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Soft tissue and orthopedic surgery, yeah. And is that where your interest in arthritis and musculoskeletal came from, or...? Yeah, no, I mean, it started at university. Um, I was very lucky because I had uh, a really good orthopedic surgeon teaching me, a guy called Mark Glyde, who's in Australia now. Um, mm-hmm. And also you get paired up with a, with another student uh, who's older than you to look after you. And that was a guy called Colin Whiting, who you know. Um, <laughs> so he was very orthopedic. Then I was lucky enough to do an exchange with the University of Illinois in America. Um, oh. And there were some very 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 good orthopedic surgeons there so i just kind of got hooked on it um i like the way that you can you know it's not one of these i mean there's some very clever people who do other parts of of veterinary medicine but this thing where you sort of measure something's potassium for three months that's not me i like i like to see things getting fixed and things getting better so um really the interest in, in arthritis actually came from when i started as a first opinion vet really because that's when you could sort of see it was the early days of proper proper um veterinary specific non-steroidals so anti-inflammatories and seeing like the kind of magic you could work on a dog that was carried in on a sheet to to be put to sleep because it couldn't walk um because it never had any medication and then and then you suddenly give it a a magic drug and it's up and happy and wagging its tail the next day you know that's the kind of thing that that really uh inspired me so although i do love surgery this is this is really i think my favorite bit is is um treatment of, of, of osteoarthritis because I think there's so much that can be done because that's mm-hmm. what people want to hear and like I was in the pub the other day as normal and some guy that I was just chatting to making an idle conversation his dog was unable to stand he was really worrying about it he him and his wife were at difficulties even talking about the dog and it wasn't mm. on the non-steroidal and I was like you know in modern day times you know this is such such a easy step so are you trying to say to the public that it's an area that you're really interested in because you get such positive results? Yes. No, like? absolutely. I mean, I, I, it wasn't that long ago that someone was in my consulting room who, who said, oh, she's got arthritis, but I know there's nothing you can do for that. Uh, it's less common now, but you just think, oh, my God, there is so much. And uh, I think sometimes... You know, it used to be that people didn't think you could do anything. Now I think there's still this idea that you put them on the on the one the one drug, the anti-inflammatory, and it'll work for a bit, and then eventually it'll stop, and and that's it. And yeah. I think we just need to make sure that people understand it's 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 not that negative. You know, I mean, this is a way being a surgeon primarily. You know, people think you're saving lives all the time, yeah. but to be honest, the kind of surgery I do, it doesn't save that many lives. It stops dogs limping, whereas managing arthritis saves lives you know it it, it mm-hmm. extends animals lives and i don't just mean dragging it out it keeps them happy for for years and years there are, there are dogs that i look after now that even 10 15 years ago would not have made it this far um yeah. because you know they would have been unhappy and they they would have been in pain so it is just it's it's making animals better it's giving them a better life it's taking away pain that's... it's just the cool thing i I love talking to you because that's exactly how I feel about it. Like I've been a vet for nearly 18 years now. And I think my dawning was about six years ago when I just really, I didn't realize how much we could do for it because I think Mm. I was very much trained 
that it was non-steroidal and then it was adjunct medication and then when that ran out you know well you've got your salvage surgeries and stuff and I started dabbling into more of the complementary side so I got my hands on mm. the whole massage thing and I was like whoa this is nuts and then that's led to rehab and it's led to other complementary therapies like laser and pulse wave and all this sort of stuff the thing that I like talking to you about is that you're quite excited about it whereas quite as you say quite a lot of people are quite negative about it yeah we've got such interesting stuff happening in this field yeah, it's cool. we? well I mean, it's interesting so, what you say because I mean six years ago you say I, I think the honest truth was six to ten years ago there, there wasn't that much we could do I mean that's that's the exciting thing about this field is that it's it, you're right there's so much that can be done and it's changed so quickly it, it wasn't yeah. that long ago that um you know there was very very little i mean if i think back to just when i, I started out as a vet you're right i mean it was a case of of, of non-steroidals and then that you're done and there weren't even that many choices of non-steroidals i think there were yeah. well i remember metacam really launching like, so it was yeah. before that yeah. it, was, it was zenicarp you know that was the the thing yeah, that yeah, saved yeah. like zenicarp when they could name a drug properly in those days um but yeah i mean you're right there's so much going on now and it, it is it is it's gone from being sort of something that was an afterthought and in the in the shed to really kind of cutting edge of medicine but the problem is it's sort of happened without anyone really noticing um there's because... been no adverts really has there the public haven't no, had a chance to keep up with this well it's not it's not that glamorous if you like a, a disease i think um you know you you see uh, things on the tv about people getting you know open heart surgery or, or stuff like that but it's not very often you see a program, you know, that gives two different medications to a dog and the dog is really happy. That's not really a TV yeah, I show. Be quite like that. <laughs> it would be cool, yeah, but you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe on a subscription I sat on a plane channel. Next to some, I sat on a plane next to somebody that does like Channel Four documentaries. I was going, look, seriously, I'm like the super nanny for dogs with arthritis. You really want me? And I never heard. <laughs> so, <I'm not> surprised. <laughs> really yeah, surprised. yeah um but but it is it's very rewarding though it, it is really rewarding i mean i think perhaps one of the things that it, it does involve and certainly coming from the orthopedic surgeon side is it's kind of the opposite to what we do what we tend to do as orthopedic surgeons is you see a problem you fix it everyone's happy and you're gone it is more a long-term um, relationship with an animal and their owner which is not something in referral work that you tend to do so it is something i quite like you know i've still got um cases from before you know when i used to be a first opinion vet i mean they're getting a bit bit old now like me but um it, it's nice to see animals that you, you've kind of worked yeah. on all this time you really know them and really know the owner and that's the way you get the best out of of arthritis management it, it's yeah. it's sort of working as a team approach and then the better you know the case and everyone involved the better you're going to get an outcome well i think that leads me very quickly just to go back to a few sentences and then we're going to dive into some questions and etc. Sure. Another thing that really inspired me wasn't just the fact that there was a huge amount that we could do about it. It was that there seemed to be a communication linker between arthritis and death. And yes. I think my, my kind of moment of clarity was seeing a dog that everything else was fine but it had no muscle mass on its back legs and it couldn't stand up and it'd been like it for quite a while and it'd been in for its vaccines on a yearly basis. And I was like, when, when did this go wrong? And I think that for me was another big dawning, but we now do know that this is a welfare concern. This mm. is one of the three things that small animal practice, you know, we really need to, to devote more time to. So obesity, dental disease and OA management. So we now yeah. have got more evidence to suggest that, this is something that we've got to pay a lot more attention to. So that's quite exciting. We've got questions already coming in. Um, okay. I think what I'm it's probably my mum. <laughs> no, she was like, yet. make sure, don't say anything stupid and try not to look like you're going bald. So I'll do what I can. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> nice. Good said, advice, that. Like, yeah. My mum said, are you growing a moustache the other day? And I was like, oh, cheers, mother. That's <laughs> Um, right so let's go for a question and then we're going to talk about how you can work with your vet then we'll come back to another question what's right, your sure. thoughts on the non-pharmaceutical pain and anti-inflammatory devices um in brackets the cc loop so that's pulse electromagnetic field therapy as an adjunct but also to help reduce opioids so let's play with that one okay we can we can start with opioids to be honest you know yeah when you're using adjuncts um, I mean, really, I think uh, I'm always a bit cautious about 
use of, of opioids long term um, mm -hmm. from the dog's point of view and also from just the point of view of, of, of handing out <laughs> loads of, of, of those kind of drugs. Um, when you say using these adjunctive therapies as an alternative or to reduce them, that is exactly correct. These are things, yeah. you know, all the way from from sort of ice packs up to really cool lasers and things where, um, if you like, we, we, we're tricking the body. Um, that it, It's basically like triggering that override that when an arthritic dog sees a rabbit, suddenly they, they've not got arthritis. It's, it's pinching yeah. that. Um, and it turns out with things like massage and heat therapy, we've done them for, for hundreds, thousands of years, but we didn't know quite how clever we were. They sound simple and, and they're actually a lot, a lot cleverer than that. Um, and something like a laser is, if you like, it's a, it's a posh heat pack. Um, uh, and with, the, with things like shockwave therapy, uh, I think what you're saying about using it as an adjunct is exactly correct. It's not where you start in some cases, um, but yeah, I mean, it, if you can in increase the benefit of what you're doing pharmaceutically, then that's great. I think also it, it's very important not to lose sight of the fact that although you can buy a flashy laser, uh, you can just as easily use a, a wheaty bag or a hot water bottle. It's, you know, it does a slightly different thing, but it's, it's in the similar area. So sometimes the, the cheap and the free stuff actually gets you better value out of the, the uh, expensive stuff like drugs. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, I, I think if, if it can be done, if it's feasible, then, then why not um, you use these things? I think, I think it's really important that, you, that they're used at the right point for the right reason. I think sometimes yeah. there's a tendency to you know, get something cool like a laser and then try and use it on, on everything. Uh, and that's not ideal, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, these, these things mustn't be forgotten. They're, they're, they're excellent. And things like, like laser therapy to avoid, I mean, what you're trying to do is you, you get this, this response between there's the pain in the joint and, and the surrounding soft tissues that triggers a spinal reflex to spasm the muscle. So actually it gets worse. That's where things like massage and, and heat will help. Um, but then with things like the, um, the shockwave therapy, stuff like that, you're actually uh, triggering certain nerve fibers to override the chronic pain fibers like yeah. chasing the rabbit um yeah. which is very very clever i mean you know, no one's thinking that they're doing that while they're doing it but this is why it works so it is a very yeah. clever system i think what i love about this area is what david somerville says and he says it every single time we are just promoting what the body's already able to do so all of these mm. adjunct therapy they're yeah. They're not doing anything more that the body can't do itself, but you're putting like a rechargeable battery that's fully powered in to help you achieve what the body can do. So the body's, the body can only heal itself. We're just helping it heal itself. Not yeah, and, um, and and also it's it's a case of you know we know that this this chronic pain, there's no real reason for it that we can understand. Acute pain we know you know it's there for for a biological reason, but the chronic pain is 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 just an annoyance yeah. really and if you can try and, and unwind some of this uh through whatever means and, and tricking the body's systems then it, then then that's great yeah. yeah so another thing just to dabble in the opioid section just a little bit um so when you said help reduce opioids we're just going to focus on the last bit of that question opioids aren't something that many therapists i know immediately go for the the trend to tramadol is really decreasing as far as i can see yeah it was very fashionable for a while but i i don't use it really occasionally no. in, a, in a in a in a flare-up but yeah no. no no i think i think about the figures are 20 percent of dogs will respond to tramadol um so that's the one that's readily available yeah and, and, and also you've got to think that um, the way dogs metabolize tramadol is very different to hum humans and cats. Yeah. It, it just doesn't hang about in the body very long. It's, it's half-life. Instead of being sort of, I think humans, it's five or six hours. In dogs, it's about 1.5, 1.7. Yeah. So you very would really cool. need to, to give continuous pain relief. You'd be needing to give it sort of six or eight times yeah. a day. And, you know, that's just a bit, a bit wacky. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not a fan of it. No, no, I must no, admit for other, chronic treatment. Okay. The other opioid that people would probably be able to relate to would be codeine. And again, that that isn't used so much as far as I'm aware. No. I know it's hard it's been hard to get hold of a lot of practitioners are doing paracetamol and codeine as yeah. a separate tablet. But 
the codeine isn't very bioavailable. So no, it's probably the paracetamol the end- that's, that's doing the good there. So. Exactly. Yeah. So just at the end of your sentence, uh, Natasha Lotta, um, opioids aren't Hi, Natasha. Really the choice of adjunct. Um, we'll talk about adjuncts later. But as for talking about your non-pharmaceutical pain and anti-inflammatory devices, I know that I agree with Jamie that they're an adjunct. And for me, the most important thing is getting that animal's pain under control as quickly and as effectively as possible. And at the moment, there is more evidence to support using non-steroidals to do that. But that doesn't mean that we're focusing and just saying we're only going to offer non-steroidals. It means that no. let's use that as the bread and let's put something in the sandwich to help. But no. don't feed the bread. You know, that no, means- I mean, for God's sake, don't don't rush out and buy a laser if, you, if you're not the animal on, on non-steroidals unless there's a very very good reason that it's not taking non-steroidals that's that's number one uh, it, mm. it really has got to be that's that's the thing that does the most good pharmaceutically um yeah so don't don't be scared of these things these are very very good very very safe drugs not for everyone just a little bit just stay with the non-steroidals just for a little yeah, bit because sure. i think a lot of people really focus only on the pain relieving qualities and they forget that non are working in different locations on our pain pathway as well as in the periphery mm. as well as centrally and i think i've definitely found when i've done owner workshops and i've gone wow do you know what non can do they're like oh i, I didn't realize they were that powerful they've no. got so much bad press it kind of swamps their good press so just tell us a little bit about non and why not to be scared of them well for a start i mean obviously you always here the, the you know the, the bad side of it but if you think how many animals are on non-steroidals for so long the actual incidence of, of of problems is very very low now of course some dogs get 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 issues with them and very very occasionally they get severe issues with them and if that's your dog then this is obviously it's a massive deal but the vast majority i mean this is these are the drugs that i use the most by far way above anything else um, and it is not that common, considering how much I use them, that, that you see a, a problem like this. I think it, there is a bit of a bad press of them all of a sudden. I've noticed in the last three or four years, people getting mm-hmm. a bit more cautious, even vets getting a bit more cautious of using them. And it, to be honest, it, it kind of surprises me a bit. I think it's because you, you get a bit of, um, obviously you hear about the stories from people where the dogs don't suit them. Also, I think, let's be honest, uh, people who are selling rival products maybe talk things up. And I think sometimes also as vets, we have to be careful uh, that we don't kind of reinforce this because, you know, talking to, to, to uh, dog owners when they speak to their first opinion vets, it's very easy to say, right, here's, here's the tablet. If it gets sick, if it vomits, you must stop it immediately. Come in every six months. We need to do blood tests. Just think, you know, and it makes it sound like the, the blood tests are because this is a highly dangerous drug. It's not really. They're, I mean, they're not even checking for the fact that the drug has done anything to the dog. They're just checking there's no reason with the dog that you shouldn't be giving it. So I think um, we, need to, we need to big these up. These, if they were invented today, we would think that they were magic, because they are. I think it's just that we're a bit used to it. And, and because this is a multimodal thing and you're always looking for other treatments, it kind of gives the impression that you're not happy with, with the, the first treatment. I'm super mm-hmm. happy with non-steroidals absolutely super yeah, happy exactly. um so so i think it, it's one of those things like getting the right weight on the dog it's it, until you've done that don't worry about the other things this is this is the start um yeah. you know this is like and i think that that's something that really frustrates me as well like we do in one of our trainings we've got a slide and in the center there's a dog and he's got behavioral change posture change capability gait changes so he's he's showing chronic pain and then around it is um, another circle and it's, it's got arrows saying for omega-3 fatty acids to work, you're looking at anywhere at least three to 12 weeks. I think um, Louise Clark was suggesting three weeks, somebody else I spoke to, you're looking at 12 weeks before it's mm. really going to have any impact. And then you've got your glucosamine chondroitins, which are really out of favour now, but that's like 120 days. And that dog's sitting there going, do you know what? I really want my pain to go yeah. today. Not, not in three months time guys and I think there's a real balance that we can get you don't have to be one or the other this isn't a religious war you, you you're no. allowed to sit on both sides of the fence and you can no, use absolutely. 
and use other things. And if you find benefit in the other things, you can come off of your non-steroidal, but let's put the dog first. And we know- Well, I mean, this is why I, I like the word complementary therapy rather than alternative therapy. This should not yeah. be an alternative. I mean, you've got yeah. to think as well with non-steroidals, like you were saying earlier. You know, I don't like when people call them painkillers. I don't like it when they call them anti-inflammatories because really they're both. But as yeah. well as the pain aspect, you know, we know, we know that arthritis basically at some point is starting with a synovitis. So there's inflammation. Yeah. So, so as well as helping with the, with the pain and the discomfort, these are just, you know, winding down that, that inflammatory process. Um, so no, they, they are like the bedrock. They're not, they're not classed as disease modifying. And I've always, I've struggled with this because in my head, little simple people, I was brain, I'm like, well, they affect the inflammatory you know, yeah. process. So they must be slightly disease modifying, but they don't get to wear that crown. Which Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't get too tangled. I think this is, because I was talking to a human rheumatologist the other day and then she was saying basically there are no available disease modifying drugs in humans, but they use all these drugs. Essentially what that's saying is that, um, I suppose non-steroidals are, are sort of treating the symptoms, if you like. They're reactive drugs yeah. rather than they're, they're interfering with the process. Um, yeah. But then there are, there are medications that I would kind of count as, as disease modifying, but officially they're not. So I think it's just yeah. one of those terminologies that let, let's just not worry too much. Pick them up again. Pick <laughs> yeah, them up someone again. somewhere has decided that this is not what it's called. So, so I wouldn't worry too much about that side of things. But yeah, um, yeah I, I, I can't, you know, if, if I had osteoarthritis, unless there was a real reason I couldn't, I would be, I'd be on the non-steroidals. So it's the same for dogs. Um, and, you know, I mean, the most common side effect really is, is an upset stomach. Um, yeah. And, that, you know, that's entirely reversible. And I think one thing that's also that's really, really important that, that I, and, and this is for owners as well as vets, yeah. is that if you've got a dog on a non-steroidal and has vomiting and diarrhea, just have a little bit of a think how often a dog will have vomiting and diarrhea in its life if it's not on non-steroidals. You know, if it's been on Metacam for five months and it's got vomiting and diarrhea, it could be a drug reaction. It absolutely could. But also, it, you know, it could have eaten a week old it's Kentucky nice. fried chicken in the street, in which yeah. case you're taking away one drug that's very useful. Or in some extreme cases, people just say, right, no non-steroidals from now on. Mm. I mean, the dog will really regret eating that, that pavement pizza if, if you know if it's going to yeah. rob them but it's, dogs are dogs so you've got to remember that just because they're on non-steroidals not every stomach upset that they get is directly a result of, of the anti-inflammatory so it is always worth if it's just if they've done really well and you've got one one upset stomach stop mm. the medication for a few days because it might well be exacerbating it but, but try and reintroduce it okay if it, if it all comes right back then then talk to your vet about yeah, can we try another one so a, a good take home message to leave people with immediately is don't be in fear of them. Please no. give them a go. I know that I use them. Uh, I'm so confident in them. I use them as a drug trial to prove whether a behavior or a posture or a change has got a pain component. That bird's hmm. going for it. Oh yeah, Raymond, please. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about well, that. Then, it's crazy. But, right. but yeah, I mean, and you're right. Then, Actually, what you're saying is, is really, really important because Pain is such a complex thing. And in humans, after years and years of research, the best they can, up, can come up with is pain is what the patient says it is. Mm. So that's very subjective. And now we've got patients who can't talk. I mean, they can do sad eyes and stuff, but we're just anthropomorphizing. So, so in veterinary medicine, we've got to believe that pain is what we believe the dog thinks the pain is, which is a really complicated thing. So the best way, the best way you're right to prove pain is to, try and remove it and see what the effect mm. is. And also with arthritic pain, obviously it's coming on gradually, which is why people often mistake this condition for a dog that is aging or you know, other things like that, because it's coming on so gradually. Some people don't even notice it at all. It's not that they're yeah. calling it something else, it's that they just don't notice. And then you yeah. give them this medication and they said the dog was fine. And then suddenly, oh my God, yeah, look at him now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I using it like, as, can, as... I, can I stop giving it because my dog's become really, really cheeky again and I started yeah. trashing the house and he hasn't done yeah. it for yeah. months. I'm like, no, 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 yeah. that's ethically incorrect. But yeah. another take home message from that is that I know how distressing it is to see your dog have vomiting diarrhea. There was one time that Holly had hemorrhagic gastroenteritis mm -hmm. and it was just like a bloodbath in the snow and it was yes. terrifying for me. Yeah. So, I do totally relate to people that say you haven't 
you know, you haven't felt how it is, I have. But I also, Holly was hugely reliant on anti-inflammatories at the end to control her pain. And mm -hmm. I didn't let that experience deny her having pain relief later. You definitely should look into trying the same anti-inflammatory again after a respite of seven to 10 days to lay the gap, allow the gastric mucosa yeah. to heal. And if you have a reaction again, don't get rid of the whole family. There's a big family out there that they have different responses. And I've had a number of dogs now that have been on two or three non steroidals and it's not till the third or the fourth that we actually find one that the dog tolerates. Yes. And tolerates really yeah, well. I mean, we so still don't know why that is. You'd think it would be that the more potent and the fewer side effects, the better the drug. And it, broadly it is. But there mm. are just some dogs that respond better to one another. And I think it's, it's got to be because uh when you get to the effect the areas the, the gates that these are acting on there is some crossover um between various uh, well, anyway i mean getting too molecular but they will act in fractionally different ways so um yeah. you know it's going to depend which one i think the other thing that's really important is uh you often hear you know people say well we'll give a uh, non-steroidal until it stops working and then we'll they don't stop working ever they never stop working. What actually happens sometimes is that the, degree, the disease, we know this disease progresses. So your non-steroidal never stops working. It's just that the disease has progressed to the point where it's breaking through your non-steroidal cover. So yeah. once the dog starts appearing painful again, my God, don't, don't stop the anti-inflammatories. They're yeah. still doing an awful lot of good. It's just that you now need to add in something else. So this idea that the dog gets used to them or they, they stop working or they become immune, no, no, it's not like antibiotic resistance or anything like that. It, it... Well, mind with this, and this is an honest question for me because I've, I've spoken to different people about it. Would you choose to swap at that point to a different one and see if the body has a, a, a new verve reaction to a new? Because I've done it a couple of times and it's, it's worked a couple of times great and I've gone, God, I'm glad I did that. But then a couple of times I've swapped from, say, um, meloxicam on to, say, rabenicoxib. And I haven't seen that improvement. And the owner's lost that bit of faith in me, which is going to be real yeah. tangible in a minute to owner communication. Do you try swapping? or do I, you just I think it one? really depends on the case. And this is where you get a bit of the art of it rather than the science. You know, if, mm -hmm. if this is a dog where um, we're sort of five months in, yeah, mm. I, I'd swap. If this is a dog that's been on the same medication for, for eight years, and has done really well. I probably wouldn't change if we started getting GI upside. Yeah, I would change it, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily leap in. And you know, I, I think the important thing is that you, there's no real science to that. And I think mm -hmm. the first thing is always discuss why you're doing it and what you intend to see. And and this is something that I would say at, at, at any. This is not just in arthritis for vets everywhere. Is is before you do anything you have to set in your mind what your goals are, what the pros and what the cons are. Mm. And, you know, why am I doing this? What could be the outcome that's good and what could potentially be the outcome that's bad? So that we know what we're looking for in, in a positive way, but also if it doesn't do what we're expecting, everyone's aware that that might be an outcome and why we're doing it anyway. So it's not a disaster, yeah. So that leads us really handily into the topic that we wanted to talk about. And don't worry, Sarah, we're going to talk about stem cells and bits and bobs like that later. Let's just <laughs> stem cells. Let's... Okay, yeah. Oh, we'll yeah. get there in a bit. Yeah. We'll get there in a Hang minute. on in there, Sarah. <laughs> we're going to talk about how to get the most out of your vet. And we're going to have a proper debate about it. And I, I can remember doing this at school where you had to kind of sometimes be the baddie and sometimes be the goodie and I'm going to try and be baddie and goodie because I love being a vet I'm really proud of my profession but there are things that we could do better and I think yep. it's worth it we, we can air these um the current system is very difficult for vets we have very short consults in very stressful environments and they're generally box rooms with no windows slippery floors not very much space to move and whilst you're consulting you always know that you've got four dentals a castrate a dog that's throwing up to see you've got blood reports you've got the receptionist is just giving you phone message after phone message yeah. it's very very stressful being a vet and then you get these chronic cases in and it can be really really hard to do what's needed but mm -hmm. let's talk about what you feel is needed in first opinion and then maybe we can mull over some ideas of how we can make that happen so i think uh the first thing the first thing where possible is to build that relationship with your vet 
Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky because, again, we've got two competing things here. We've got wanting from the side of the vets and from the side of the client to give the same vet as often as possible. But we also have this, this need to provide veterinary care as much as possible. So you clearly, you, you can't have the same vet seeing everyone all the time and 24 hour cover. So there is always that balance. But for me, that the, the first thing, that the most important thing is, is to build a relationship with one or two vets where possible. Now I know it's not always possible, but then if you think about a similar thing, well, maybe not too similar, but you know, everyone has their favorite hairdresser. Okay. You're not going to have hairdressing emergencies too often, except I saw you yesterday when you just, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you try and work around it. She's not in that day. Okay. I'll book it a different day. It, it, it is a balance because, you know, if there's a crisis and your vet is on holiday, of course, you're going to see someone else. So having like a, a spare vet that you also get on with it, it is very good. Um, How can they do that? Because a lot of owners don't realise that you can actually ask to see a specific vet. This always yeah. surprises me. Um, I have so many owners say, oh, I just see this one. And I'm like, well, why don't you ask to see um, Shelby? Yeah, and I, I just see, who, I just wait till I walk in the door and see who, sh who shouts my name. Yeah, yeah just ask. Yeah. Um, and, and vets like it. And I think this is the other thing. So I'm always telling vets, you know, build up a relationship with the client, but the mm -hmm. other way around, I mean, vets are often very stressful. We're very, no, you know, we, we feel a lot of pressure and I think that's partly the job and partly perhaps who we are. We tend to be sort of perfectionists. Mm -hmm. We, we feel the responsibility of trying to fix everything all the time, always know the answer immediately, never go wrong. Um, and we're always very worried that, uh, clients don't like us or don't approve of what we're doing. Yeah. If you, if you tell your vet, like, I really like what you're doing, can I see you next time? As well as asking, I mean, ask the receptionist, sure. But if the vet knows that you, you appreciate what they're doing, then, then they're just on side. And, and, and for me, I always think, we'll probably get onto this later, but arthritis management, especially, it's a team game. It, the days of, of the, the old guy in the white coat saying, right, take these pills and come back in a month, you know, it's, it's gone. It's, it's a combination of, of the vet, the owner, the dog themselves, maybe a, a hydrotherapist, all these people. Um, yeah. Vets need to get used to that. Yeah. They need to make the most of it. Uh, but owners also, also do. And, and the owner is, is a really important part of that. So the better you all know each other and, and the more you, you get on, uh, the better things are going to be. So do ask to see the same vet where possible. Find a vet that, that you think is good. You know, I mean, that, that's always important. Um, but uh, yeah, building that relationship is good because if Definitely. they don't know the dog, I mean, it's so hard. You know, sometimes you, you, you treat a dog, especially in referrals, you've never seen this dog before uh, and they seem a lovely dog, whatever. And, and like you say, then you fix them and you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize <laughs> this, is, this is a really happy dog normally. Um, whereas if that's your vet that you're seeing day in and day out, then, then they're going to know and, it, and they'll pick it up as well because also the client, the owner, sees that dog every day and sometimes they don't even pick it up but you say well i haven't seen you for three months and and look at you know he's he's not wagging his tail he's just sitting in the corner today usually he's all around so it's those things and that's not necessarily being a good or a bad vet that is um observing the so this is a big thing you know you can't treat if you don't observe and this is what i'm always saying to, to, to vets and people alike is don't just say oh how are you doing he's doing okay have a good look you know is he is he doing something he didn't used to be able to do or is he not doing something he did used to be able to do and look at him walk and, and, and look at these things and if you know the better you know your dog and that goes for the vet as well as the owner the more likely you are to pick up subtle changes and yeah. and that's the trick for me um i you know sometimes when somebody brings me in something really subtle or whatever you think oh my god this is gonna take me a long time but then that's the right time to do it it's challenge you know make make me work because if I can see it walking across the car park and I say, Oh my God, it's got that, you know, that's usually when we're, when we're on the back foot. Whereas if it's coming in, you're thinking, well, I, mm, I'm not sure. Yeah. And when the owner is saying, I, I don't know. And this is another thing about knowing your vet is that if you don't know who you're going to see, it's very hard when you're thinking, should I take him to the vet? Should I not? You think, Oh, I probably won't. If you know your vet, then you can go in and say, or you can, you can get a message to them and say that I'm, I'm not sure. Should I be coming to that? Well, usually that's the right time. Usually that's the right so time if you're not sure. You've opened up a little doorway here. I know that I don't mind receiving emails. I know that I don't remind, I mind receiving phone calls. Um, I'm very lucky to be working in a place where within my work hours, I can do those commitments rather than some jobs I've worked at where you get to seven o'clock, you want to go home and suddenly you've got all these people to phone. So I am in a privileged position. I realize that. 
but I do think it's worth speaking to your vets and say, can I please correspond with you in other ways as well as mm -hmm. my consult if I'm worried, if I, yes. you know, I don't know whether I need to be seen. So that's one thing. Um, I do think that it also gives you the opportunity to send video clips in. So 15 minutes, um, I had to do seven minutes a few months ago. It was insane. My <laughs> first job, me. and I know there's someone from my first job watching, we used to do five minute consults and they would double book every 15 minutes in case someone didn't turn up. So you're saying now we're under pressure, you know, going to 15 minute consults is yes. a massive change for the better for vets and for clients. Oh, uh, absolutely. Sometimes it doesn't feel enough, but yeah, like you're saying, comp compared to where things used to be, it, it, where it's, it used it's to huge. Be um, but the vets are still under a lot of pressure because, you know, for example, it, often uh, your 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 six monthly arthritis check yeah. is the same consult that's the dog's booster. So in that clip. consult, nail clip, perhaps even a blood test for, because you're on medication. The vet's yeah. being told also to discuss insurance. Uh, to discuss worming treatment, to check the animal's heart, to check its teeth. You know, it is a bit insane. Now I know, and I always speak about this because this is where you have to fight a bit because always arthritis can get pushed to the bottom because, you, yeah. you know, if you speak to a cardiologist, oh my God, you need to listen to his heart for like a minute at least. Well, yeah. already that's, that's taking in. And, you know, there are other things going on that need to be looked at. So I think if I could give one other bit of advice to owners, it would be if you say to your vet, if, if you're particularly worried about your animal's arthritis and you're in one of these crazy do everything in 15 minute booster, whatever, is just say to the vet, look, I, I, I appreciate you don't seem to have enough time right now doing all these other things, you know, taking a blood test, doing a vaccination with this. Yeah. How about I would prefer it if you if we booked another appointment purely to talk about the osteoarthritis and you'll probably just see this relief going into the vet's face because they're kind of under the impression that you want everything done all in one go, minimum yes. time, minimum. And also they worry because people often will complain, oh, you know, I just went in and, and didn't do anything probably because they're trying to rush to do everything. I, I, in my experience, clients aren't complaining about the cost. They're complaining about the value for money. You know, if you're paying for a recheck and someone just comes in and you say, how's your dog doing on Prebocox? He's doing okay. Okay, on Prebocox. Here's another six months. Yeah, I would complain about that. I wouldn't want to pay 30 pounds for that. However, if you said, look, I, I've got these other things to do. We need to talk about your dog's nails, ears, vaccines, whatever. I can do another 15 minutes where we focus just on this, just on this. It will cost you whatever, a, you know, a consult is like 30 pounds or something. But if you think about it, you're probably going to get way more than £30 benefit over the next six to 12 months for your dog for that. that that's actually yeah. really good value for money. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, mean, I don't like talking well. about money, but, you know, yeah, it, no, it's, no, it's, it's time. That's what yeah. Cam's about. Cam is about actually not just sticking to the script. It's talking about the reality of what this disease incurs for the owners for the vet professionals for the therapists etc to add to that um we know that owners take between 20 and 40 percent of what we say home so i know that i put my heart and soul into these consults it's my passion but i know that they're not taking it in because i'm condensing so much into a short space of time and they yeah. i can see the owners just picking slight little bits whether they actually take the truth of what i was saying home or just a snippet so they did a study yeah. in human medicine and they found that um the clients that came to see the doctor remembered about 20 percent of what was said and the sad thing is 50 percent of that 20 was wrong <laughs> like, yeah oh and then the first thing they'll do is go and ask the receptionist what did the vet say and the receptionist you, wasn't there and then they the yeah so you can talk about the team so um just to big up cam we do a training called the 08a team and we train receptionist nurse and vets all separately but then also together in one day so the whole practice hears the same thing but for different understanding different levels of understanding reception are part of that team because I know a lot of the places I've worked, I haven't been able to leave my room. You know, it really yeah. is quite an intense environment. But having the receptionists who generally, you know, some of them have been there for 10, 15 years. They remember the dog coming in as a puppy. They're yeah. people that can flag up um, non, you know, um, non-age related change. You know, this the dog's getting old a bit too early or that's, mm -hmm. that's a behavior change. That's a posture change. That's something that's going on. So reception, you really are worth your weight in gold. Yeah. Um, 
what I did do at one practice is um, we used to use um, pound signs in the diary if the if the owner there was something a little bit fishy about what was coming in to see me I could see on the diary that there'd be a pound sign I'd be like oh phone reception what's 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 going on has he got angry about something or so yeah. you can use little tips like that to help and be part of the vet team so if but, you see that dog uh, struggling to get up you can let the vet yeah, know because i mean also the receptionist has seen the dog walk in uh, and the vet doesn't always see quite so much walking and i i think that's absolutely true um the other statistic i remember was that that I think it was something like nine seconds is the average that a vet listens before they interrupt, which is, a, 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 you know, a sign of time pressure. Um, but I think also one thing that, that owners need to work on as well is that w this is Britain and we're very polite. We don't want to upset people. And yeah. part of, we get this kind of like pseudo placebo effect is because the vet gives you a medication and you come back and they say, how's it doing on this really cool new medication that I gave you that I think is really wonderful. How's it doing? And because this is Britain, you go, oh, yeah, great, really well. And then they go out to reception and they say, oh, but it's, it's crap. <laughs> and you think, well, yeah. no, don't, don't say it there. Say it in don't the console. Right you know, be honest. And this is this, is this relationship of trust is that you're, you're not telling them they're a bad vet. They've done this. Yeah. Like you said, it's a trial. And yeah. I say this to people, I'm going to use this drug. I honestly want to know how the dog is doing. And, and, and making no difference is a perfectly valid answer. Because that's yeah. why I'm doing it. You know, I want to know. That's I don't want to give a. Know. I don't want to give a drug that's not helping, yeah. but I don't know I the answer. I... You can't just give like a, a list. Well, we'll do that, 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 yeah. because it doesn't always work the same way. So, this understanding between you and the vet is so important because really they should. They, they're not going to take offence when you say, "I'll try this yeah. drug to see if it's better than the other well, drug." Don't you think that um, Little Britain and David Williams and stuff should do a vet surgery because there's so many weird things that happen in vets that whether they happen in any other industry but as you say an owner will in your room go yeah yeah absolutely 100 percent," and then they'll go to the desk which is only five seconds away i go I didn't understand where they said you know like, no. well you were oh, in no, there with me for 15 minutes it's crazy and sometimes that is uh yeah, yeah i mean that they're not paying attention or something like that but sometimes also it is us rushing and and perhaps yes. not checking you but know that's before you go the other member of the team is the nurse yeah. The nurses, they don't butt in like we do. I just butted in on you. But the nurses, um, I've been watching them. They're really good listeners compared to vets. If we were to do like a survey of who yeah. has to butt in first, vets generally do. And I think it is, as you say, time pressure. Yeah. On keeping the consult on track. But a lot of clinics now are doing nurse consults to support the mm -hmm. vets. It's vet-led, nurse-run, reception-supported. So do do ask if your clinic does that. Yep. Um, just because of time pressures, let's jump to stem cell and then stem we'll cells. go back. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because okay. this is going to be really interesting. I've not spoken to you about stem cells, so it's going to be interesting. Okay. We've got All loads right. more. Go on. So, then, what Jamie. do you want to know? What do you want to know? Wow. Well, so, so, what I are stem have... cells? Let's start with what are stem cells? Yes. So, basically, if you want to break it down completely, every animal human whatever starts off as as one cell like a fertilized egg then they become two then they become four whatever uh, and each of those cells contains all the dna to make a, an entire animal Being. yeah so at some point you know you shut each cell shuts off all the things that it's not and has to pick what it is so the further back you go to that original state each cell is able to do more before it becomes specialized so same as a person you know when you're uh, uh, you can be anything by the time you've done yeah, a certificate like and a master's and whatever you're, you're pretty, you're pretty focused. So a stem cell yeah. is just one further back. So if you were to take, say, uh, that number one cell, the first cell that could theoretically become anything. So then you've got like embryological stem cells, which pretty much still could become anything. Then you get things in, in, in orthopedics, we talk about mesenchymal stem cells. So they're sort of connective tissue. So they've, they've differentiated so that they will become things like um, muscle, oh, tendon, bone. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're going back and saying, this is sort of a, a parent cell that can become these things. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when they were sort of picked up and people thought you could use them in medicine, obviously the idea was, well, if I've got say a bad joint or a bone fracture, I'll put in all these cells and they will then turn into what I cartilage cells or joint cells or whatever or bone cells and then fix the problem it will be like magic 
uh, now that's not entirely, you know, otherwise that would be amazing. I, I think, I mean, it, we call it regenerative medicine and in, and in many ways, and in many cases, it is regenerative medicine. In other ways, it's not. You know, we know the idea was if you put stem cells into an arthritic joint, we all kind of hoped that they would fix everything and you go back to how you were. Well, no, we know that's not the case. So actually, when you use them in a joint, uh, they are sort of what we call inflammatory modulators. They, they, they tend to have sort of a, an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, you can use them to, to aid repair of certain tissues like tendon ligament repairs. Um, well, like they're they're but, site managers in that way, aren't they? they they're, they're not there at the bricks themselves. They're the site manager going, right, come on, let's try and get you working and let's do you, let's do you. Yeah. They're not necessarily. Yeah. And I think that's why the more appropriate term is biological medicine than, say, regenerative. Yeah. I think regenerative I think can be a bit misleading. That's sensible. And, and I think uh, when it comes to, to stem cell medicine, we're you could put it as either exciting or confusing phase because we're in the early stages and we've got this and, and we're thinking, well, like, what, what can we use it for? Can we use it for all these things? And I think what's going to happen in the next few years is that we're going to be able to find out what it's best at and in, in what situations. So you may find that at the moment, my, my worry is that people are just injecting stem cells mm -hmm. into all sorts of things. Um, no real logic or science behind and you're asking it to do things that it, it isn't necessarily great at doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to get more focused and we're going to use it. And also we're going to work out ways perhaps for things that it's not so great at. Is there a way we can make it better? Um, mm -hmm. Like I injecting it directly into certain lesions or building scaffolds to put them in. Also, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are there better ways that we can uh you know because you basically you're taking this this vial of stem cells and putting them somewhere you know how do we get them how do we get the most effective how do we get the right number do they need to come from which tissue do they need to even come from that animal uh how do we store them how do we process them and at the moment it's a bit of a wild west you know this is not massively regulated so you don't you don't know what it is you're getting. So if we don't know what's the best way to use them and what's the best, what, what you actually got in that syringe, it's very hard to then judge where the best effects are. So it, it is early days and, um, you know, the evidence is, is not all in one place yet. That doesn't mean it's not going to be. I think it, it will be. And it's very, very yeah. exciting. I um, think just to butt in, I think for me, I'm finding, because I'm learning and I am really, really baby in this at the moment, hmm. that... There's a lot of information out there. I think I listened to a podcast and there's something like 1800 clinical trials about stem cells currently going globally at the moment. You mm -hmm. know, this is an insane amount of work, but everybody's doing it different and everybody's yeah. using it slightly different and everybody's monitoring it differently and everybody has got a different approach. And I was um, in Ghent at the European College of Sports Medicine and there was a guy talking about platelet rich plasma and what kind of amazed me is he didn't know how rich his platelets were that he was putting in. He didn't, he didn't have any validation of what he was injecting and he used a processing way that isn't what is now recognized as superior. Yeah. And, but that paper, that clinical trial goes into the soup. So all it does. Of these clinical papers, and then they, that poor practice brings down the mean, doesn't it? So yeah. if we've got some people that are doing really amazingly well, but there's a few other people that are contributing really poor data, it brings the whole data down with it. It does. I, think, I mean, there's been an explosion of, of providers of this worldwide. You know, yeah. before you, you couldn't, unless you went into like a university laboratory, there's no way you could access uh, stem cells. Whereas now... I mean, I, I can't remember someone showing me the figures in America, the, the number of, uh, of of laboratories that would offer this. But, but again, check by whom, and you know, how, how do I know if, if someone sends me um, a, a vial of stem cells? Is it what it says on the tin? I don't know because, again, it's not regulated. So that doesn't mean it, it's bad at all. It could be wonderful. It might not be. I don't know. Therefore, the effect that I see is it because it's a good or a bad treatment theoretically or is it because i've just got a bad <laughs> you know a bad injection so unfortunately at the moment you'd have to say that a lot of what's going on is is anecdotal um people saying oh we tried it in our clinic and we've got some great results well people say this about a lot of things and, and how many some how many and you know we know there's a massive placebo effect in all sorts of treatments and if you know and the, the vet's very excited and the owner the owner has paid a lot of money you both want this yeah. to work very well but we know that 
arthritis, osteoarthritis, it, it, you know, waxes and wanes. And you do things when they're at their worst. So, you know, even when you look at the, 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 the double-blinded controlled trials where they're testing new non-steroidals. So this yeah. is like as, as good as you can get. This is as, as uh, objective as you can get. And you see something like uh, Carprofen where they say, they're, you know, 42% improvement on this. But you also see there's a placebo effect of about 20, 25%. So this is in the most, the most clinical setting. These dogs are, you know, some of them are getting better when they're not having any treatment at all. So we have to be really careful. This is something, take home message, massive, with shining lights, glitter and baubles, is that placebo happens with everything, guys. So mm. even if you're not interested in stem cell, if you're going onto Amazon and you're buying a coat with lasers in it, or if you're buying um, some new mat that your dog can earn, it's got magnets in it, or you are so ready for caregiver placebo. You're so ready mm. to be sucked in because you will see an improvement doesn't matter necessarily mean it's that thing so just be careful please be yeah. careful because and this applies to vets too because i read a study which showed that vets also also mm. see a you know we, we we tend to say oh well of course it's doing better yeah because i want it to do better I've, I've operated on it or given it a new drug mm. so we do have to be careful and, and this idea that, that you can't have a placebo effect because it's an animal and they don't know what you're doing well they don't know what you're doing no <laughs> but <laughs> but you do, but the dog might also just get better anyway. It might, you know, it's not like the arthritis is gone. It's just improving and, 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 and getting worse and whatever. So it, it is very important that we kind of sort it out. And, you know, sometimes I sound awfully snooty about this stem cell thing because I just want to say, like, stop it. Just do it properly, please. Um, because it, 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 it's crazy out there. And, you know, you see crazy. people are injecting these things subcut for cancer. And you're like, come on, that no 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 and well, and you know when you say it. also you see studies where people say to dogs with with uh stifle with knee arthritis and so some of them did well and some but, but why why have those dogs got knee arthritis have some of them got unstable knees in which case it's not going to work and some of them you know it, it really depends why they've got arthritis and what other forces are, are working so it needs to be done really really objectively until we get consistency of um of provision of these and consistency of, of what we're actually testing it on, which, which animals we're using it on. It's going to be very hard to get valid data. So we know that what we're doing is, is the correct thing. Um, so is, it's the future. Definitely. Down, you need to get a good diagnosis and that doesn't yeah. mean where I'm working at the moment, we have cases come to us and it's got elbow arthritis and it isn't until you do reverse, let's look again. Oh, well, we've got a bit of carpal OA, so we've got a bit of arthritis in the wrist as well. And we've got a little bit up in the shoulder. We've got a tendinopathy mm. and we've got a bit of a bad lumbosacral region that's growing weight forward. And that all impacts on whether those stem cells have got any chance of effect. And that my big pet hate, and I'm going to say it, is when people are doing interventions and dogs really fat and I'm sitting there going, <laughs> let's try and get some weight off this dog as well because that's a no-brainer because that's well you say a no-brainer you say a no-brainer but the study was only done i think it was about 10 years ago where in glasgow they showed that that to lose it was something like i don't know 20 percent of body weight of an obese dog was gave as much effect as giving them non-steroidals now that's not yeah. saying you should do it instead of non-steroidals but yes you're right you know yeah. and and when i uh, I was I was writing a talk the other day and I was very proud of myself. I did this beautiful slide where I had this pyramid. It's like, until you've done the base, don't do the next level, don't do the next level. I thought it was so super cool. And I went and I spoke to Danny, who was there, and she showed me exactly the same slide that she'd already made. And I was a bit like, I thought it's kind of cool. It's really cool that we think the same way, but I'm also a bit gutted because I thought I was really clever. But interestingly, there are a couple of things that were in different positions, which is interesting because, you know, I'm coming from one point, but it is really good. But yes, I mean, until until you've got, basic pain relief and correct body weight and you 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 know your exercise plan is correct you've got to avoid the sedentary lifestyle until you're doing those things don't worry about stem cells yet i mean that that's that's the icing on the cake yeah. it may not even be necessary because if you if you fix those basic things which let's face it are, are not going to cost you thousands of pounds to be honest feed your dog less dog food you're going to save money and it's going to get better it, it, it's this vicious cycle of, of they've got sore joints, so they don't move so much, so they get fat, so they get more sore, so they do le even less, so they get fatter. It's, it's getting into that and, and getting it out of the way. And, and you know, it's, it's understanding that and, and nipping in and working out where do, we, where do we break that cycle? Is it 
pain relief? Is it actually doing the exercise? Is it feeding the dog less? Is it all of those things? Mm -hmm. um, and if there's something that you can't do, is there a better way of doing it? If the dog really can't go out for walks, well, this is hydrotherapy. And um, if the dog can't lose weight just by feeding it less, do you go on a specific weight loss diet? I think so, it goes to owner education. I think um, if I could have anything as of tomorrow, so I win the lottery tonight and I have 160 million to spend on something, part of what I'd spend it on is making an owner education, little mini course, really interactive, really fun to listen to, that on that diagnosis, every owner gets the opportunity to learn the basic principles because if they can understand the foundations, then they can make good decisions. But at the moment, they're not being taught the basics. And as you say, movement is key. They need to be moving. And that means yes. you need to modify the environment. You need to modify what you do with them. But they need yeah. to be moving. And if yeah. that means... I mean, the way to, that I like to say it, because if you say you've got to do exercise, it gets a bit confusing, is avoid a sedentary lifestyle. Yes. That's Lovely. it. Yes. It is, it's they got to be moving they don't need to be catching frisbees they don't need to be yeah. running up and down mountains they don't need to be going you know if, if the if all the dog seriously can do is 20 minutes around the block well do it several times a day don't yes. don't get to the point where they've done fine and then you're dragging them around the next 40 minutes on the end of the lead no 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 but Think about the if, if you're like not hydraulics and police systems you know well you yeah because being used, it's just gonna... yeah well we were talking earlier about this um when we were talking about uh, uh, the, the, the lasers and stuff you've got this where you have pain in the joint and then the spinal reflex spasms the muscle yes. so you get this, this contracture and, and then you get muscle atrophy which then gives more pain in the joint because it's not supported so this is like a hideously vicious cycle and you were saying before mm -hmm. about that dog that had no muscle on its back end uh, mm -hmm. it, it just needs to walk and use these muscles because if you're not using them they're going to go and, and then it's really hard to get it back and yeah they need to just be doing this you know on the lead 10 minutes that it go is, is you know 10 minutes for a dog walking on a lead is, is nothing let's face it because dogs should be running around all day but yeah. it's, a, it's an infinite amount more than doing nothing yes. you know that's 100%. that's the vital thing so, so yes the, i mean so just leaving the stem cell because we've got more questions stem cell i think for my take, I've moved from Brighton to Scotland because I'm really fascinated of where it's going. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in it. I think it needs to be better regulated. If, mm -hmm. I, if I was an owner going into it, I would be wanting to have a seriously thorough conversation. I would expect a seriously thorough diagnostic workup to make yeah. sure that where I'm planning to treat is actually the problem area. Or yeah. If it was just one or was there more problems i would make sure that i am seeing some proof of what is going to be implanted so we do certificate of analysis to know that what is actually going to be placed in that joint is what i expect it to be at the concentration mm -hmm. i'd expect the person that is delivering the system to be pretty experienced with it and to know what they're up to so we plant implant as you say in the lesion or in the joint and it's a full workup beforehand I would also expect them to be objective monitoring going on and I would be expecting that to cover not only physical improvements, so muscle mass, goniometry, force plate, um, stance analysis, but also looking at emotional states and the dog's behavioural changes. So if you're not getting somebody that's really responsible for their intervention because we're talking thousands of pounds so if that person isn't going to be like i want to see that this works mm. and i'm getting the foundations right i'd be a little bit hesitant personally well That's yeah and if, if you think because i mean this is this is quite an expensive intervention and also usually it will involve say two anesthesias even one to take tissue out one to put yeah. things in and you've got to think when we're talking about that pyramid with the whole um pain relief and, and weight management things at the bottom and this is kind of a, a, at the pinnacle and you've got to get that sorted it's kind of like you know in, in um i think it was in olympic cycling they were talking about these marginal gains you know so yes. your, your center ground is is your, your your pain management so that's equivalent of checking your bike's got the, the right gear ratio yeah. down at the bottom is making sure you've not got your stabilizers on it's only when you get then to the top yeah. you're worrying about is shaving my leg hair going to improve my personal be best? Yeah, exactly. You know, don't, don't go stealing IMAC and tell your dad's taken your stabilizers off. It's, yeah. it, it's that kind of level because don't, don't inject stem cells into your dog 
you know, I heard someone the other day say the good thing is that they take some fat out as well to do it. So it's, no, no, lose the weight. <laughs> Don't rely on, yeah. this is not an expensive version of lipo. <laughs> get, get these sorted out. And, 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 you know, okay, there's a place for stem cell medication, I think, in, in, in joints that are not responding to all these other things you're doing. But you've got to have done them first. Otherwise, yeah. you know, you, 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 yeah, you, I mean, you, you always got to think that your, your arthritis is essentially stemming from abnormal load through a normal joint or, or the other way around, uh, normal load yes. through an abnormal joint. And once you're in arthritis, you've got both, especially if you've got an overweight dog, you've got abnormal load through an abnormal yeah. joint. Unless you do something to address those things, then anything else you do, no matter how cool, is, is sort of snipping around the edges. Um, yeah. And that brings in flooring. Perfect. Just my little chance about flooring, which I plan to have on my gravestone. She cared about flooring. And yeah. um, that's your abnormal load. So even if you've got normal joints, so I really strongly believe in the next five our rearing, our um, development of dogs, we're going to be much more aware about the environment that we choose to develop them in. But slippery floors, unnatural environments are abnormal forces compromised joints so really think about it let's move on uh, da -da 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 -da. well i mean you've also got to remember that one of the first changes in osteoarthritis is an alteration in, in what we call proprioception which is sort of awareness of where your your, your foot is and if it's slipping oh, it's and gone. things like this Explain it so uh so proprioception is one of the finest tuned little bits of, of, of neurology so it is that awareness if you were say if you imagine that you were standing uh with in a shop and one foot was on the escalator how quickly would you know that that foot was moving you would you'd feel it instantly and you correct it if you were a little bit drunk you'd have to wait until you started to fall and then you see the world turning upside down so that's when you've lost proprioception so that's why you know if you're walking in this um it, well exactly that you know you, you you see someone whose proprioception is is, is changed or a dog whose proprioception is changed they have, it's longer before they can correct themselves because they don't feel it. And you can test this in the, uh, in the consulting room. The, the best way I find to test for fine is you make the dog stand with one foot on a piece of paper and then you just pull the piece of paper. And normally the dog just does this and they're not even aware of it. They've just done it. In the abnormal ones, you start to see and in, in the home environment, this is what you see where a dog eats in the kitchen. And as they eat, their back legs start to move like this. And they're not really aware of it because they're concentrating on the food. So proprioception is really important. And it just means that, you, that they're not feeling these, these, these slips early, which is why they fall. And obviously, if you fall and you've got a bad joint, it's going to hurt a lot more. Therefore, you're not going to want to get up. And it's another of these vicious cycles. It's all about vicious circles in, in osteoarthritis. It is about vicious circles. And fall it hurts guys it really does like again in the pub i'm always in the pub and the guy said to me oh he's, he, he keeps falling over and i'm like well this has to stop he said oh it's okay because it doesn't hurt and i'm like no way man that is always gonna hurt like i was we were talking yesterday about a set of videos that i could do to just get the point going that fell down the stairs repeatedly mm. to show that it actually hurts or the vet that falls out the back of the car repeatedly to show that it hurts but the, i mean this, this it is a, does hurt. this is a time where it's really important to relate relate what you're doing it, we're, we're, we're very normal at seeing dogs dogs are crazy they fall over they do all these things they're destructible dogs are very proactive they, they don't care as long as the, the sun is shining they'll, they'll override all sorts of things but if you relate it back yeah. to the human experience not so much the room, but like your, your grandmother has arthritis. Then suddenly it's that. And, and, you know, my house is okay for my dog. Well, okay, but have you tried walking around it on your hands and knees with no shoes on? You know, you, there's some things that are actually quite painful. And it's the same. Also, you can use it the other way around. You know, what should I do for my dog that has osteoarthritis? Well, do you, mm. the owner? Oh, yeah, I do. So what do you do? Oh, well, I, I put heat bags on. Well, okay, there you go. You know, just relate it to what you're doing. Would you specifically jump out of your Range Rover? No, no, I wouldn't. Okay, so, so but, yeah, so, so owners, but sometimes you take someone just to say, well, what do you think? You know, don't wait for me to tell you. And what do you think? That's a really good one. 
we had a lady um, who we, we put a shout out saying, how can we instruct owners to stop using ball chuckers, especially for the arthritic cases? And um, one lady just um, commented that she had arthritis in her elbow and shoulder and it hurt to use it. And I was like, well, that's perfect, isn't it? You're not using it because it hurts you. So why would you use yeah. it to hurt them? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. come on, you know, you're crazy. Um, let's look at a few more of these questions. Um, blah, 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 not every single person is the same person, blah, 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 blah. Oh, Colin Whiting's watching. It's because he's got the day oh. off as well. Um, glucosamine and chondroitins are out of favour yep. now, please. Can you please elaborate? Uh, out of favour? I... Basically, again, glucosamine and chondroitin, when they, they were brought in, so they're sort of one of the building blocks of cartilage. And the idea was, if we can give that, will it rebuild? Will it regenerate the cartilage? And that was the hope that it would. So if you had a defect in cartilage, either from arthritis, if you've got some cartilage ulceration or fibrillation, would giving these things then build it back up again? And uh, people reported some benefit when they were taking it. So we thought, oh, wow, it must be fixing the cartilage. And then it was shown that wasn't the case. And it's quite complex. Now, there are some studies. There was a, uh, the human study, I think it was called the GATE study, where they gave um, glucosamine chondroitin in combination to people with knee pain. And I think uh, a fair proportion of those reported a reduction in pain. Um, other studies have shown less, less benefit. So it was one of the mainstays. I mean, essentially, it was the best supplement we had and now it's just kind of been shunted down um mm -hmm. it's a very bold claim to say it doesn't work I, you know it's benefit so it, it, i i wouldn't just stop it but there are other things i would i would put first um so it yeah. you know and it I does think, potentially think, yeah. have some benefit just always with these things it, it, it it's not just enough to say that there's been benefit proven you've got to think What's the benefit versus the, the cost, if you like? And I don't just mean money, but money is included, of course. What's the, what's the benefit versus the input? And if you're making a lot of fuss and you're spending a lot of money or a lot of time or a lot of worry to get a 1% change, you know, is that a benefit? Is there something else you could be doing that is better? So often with some of these, these uh, supplements, they might have more than one thing in. And, and um, you know, for example, if they've got omega-3 in, that's going to be doing better. That's been shown. That will, that will do better fears in your inflammatory pathway um so uh yeah i'm going to be outlanded i now on my pyramid i have definitely put lifestyle adaption before my supplements because yes, i have too. my experience yeah and looking at what's happening in the human world in the NICE guidelines, they talk about lifestyle adaption, weight loss, stop playing squash, start playing badminton, get rid of the kids and heels, wear flats, you know, get rid of the sports car, get something more sensible. Mm. I think we can learn a lot from that. And I have worked in many different first opinion practices, some of them in quite, you know, um, expensive areas and some in very much less so. So for me, ethically, when I'm coming up with a plan for an owner, I want to make sure that I can do something that's within their budget. Yes, and I'm going to get the best effect for their budget and best, me best them bang on for your buck. System. Yeah, but I, I think I mean you're right. I, I think human medicine does that better. They start with those things. I think honestly, honestly, I think at a, a GP level, our pain management is better. I think it's better monitored, and I think it's 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 actually better done. Um, but this is where we in, need in this one. Then, in humans. Yes. Yes. Well, you, you, you try going to your doctor and saying, I've got pain. Mm. Good luck with that. He'll probably give you a very, very good, um, you know, lifestyle changes and all, all those things. But you're not going to end up perhaps for, for quite a long while with a, a multimodal uh, pain management system. No, I think we do that better. But that's because we've got things in a slightly different way. You know, you, GPs have a slightly different role in, in, in human medicine. So I think this is where one medicine, we need to learn from each other. Um, I, th I think you're right. You know, I in human it. medicine, they have they have uh, occupational therapists, they have physiotherapists, and, and all these are, are good early referrals um, before you then start seeing you know um, pain management specialists, orthopedic consultants. So sometimes we do it a different That's way around. That's what I was going to say. Is I went out for um, a drink. <laughs> it sounds so repetitive. With a first opinion doctor, and his interest in arthritis was pretty poor and mm. because they had other people to refer
um, information providers. So he said, well, I send them to Arthritis Research UK, which is now versus arthritis. So they've got an online platform for reliable, current, evidence-based information. And I get the occupational therapist involved. I suggest that they need to see a physio. That's job done. And, and I was like, wow. And he says, I yeah. can stick to 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's true, though. But, well. We won't go that way yet. Okay, so no. glucosamine chondroitin, um, moving on from there, there is, um, from our, our looking at it, there are studies that strongly support and there's studies that don't show evidence and that therefore makes it very difficult to advise. It's part of the management plan. It's not something that you're going to 100% rely on. So please don't be putting them on glucosamine and chondroitin when they're known to be in pain. I think that's my take home from that, is that if you've got yes, a dog that's coming... attend to the other things to first, to yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, more on la, 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 la. Colin Whiting. You may not be old enough to remember the belief that non steroidals accelerated cartilage deterioration in OA rather than being protected by delaying articular inflammation. I think that perception, oh goodness, sorry, apologies, that then about the potency will decline with time with tolerance like opioids may still persist in some quarters yeah yeah 100%. i mean i remember I, when uh, when rimadil they made a big fuss to the fact that it was chondroprotective I'm colin um bless him <laughs> uh but but yes and, and also it's very interesting if you, if you talk to human uh, practitioners you know there are some things that we think are, are dreadful you know, like injecting steroids into an arthritic joint or, or local anaesthetic, you know, this, is, this will damage your chondrocytes. And they do it all the time. You know, I mean, how many sports mm -hmm. people do you know with an arthritic joint who've had a steroid injection? And yet we, we're, we're very nervous about doing it. Um, but I think it's just... paper out recently suggesting that steroids in um, these sports people, they're now going, shit, why do we do that? That's, you know, the, the long-term effects are beginning to... Well, this is, this is definitely one of the things is, is why are you doing it? You know, if you're doing it in a person that has chronic pain, whatever you do, that is fine. In a sports person, mm. uh, off topic, but is this a person who actually would not suffer pain if they stopped playing football every day? Okay. So actually, yeah. whose choice is that? You know, is that someone where the manager should actually say, hey, you know, how about taking up cleaning windows instead of Premier League football? Which, so why? Which, why? why? Question. Um, if um, an owner consent, an owner is um, the person of their own pain has made a decision. I want to continue playing professional football. I know yeah. that having a steroid in my joint might affect me negatively later in life, but that's my choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult and I'll probably get shot down when it's a, a dog who isn't an intervention so they can continue at a high level sport. I, I'm, I'll I'm shoot you down really right now. Them. No, I won't shoot you down, but it is important. It is an interesting point because if you were to, uh, it depends. It depends massively on the dog. You know, when you talk even about amount of exercise versus arthritis, um, you know, we know that lying still on the bed is crazy. But you know, I've read somewhere that dogs with arthritis should not be allowed off the lead. Makes sense. But then also you get mm -hmm. dogs that want to run around all day, and you know that there's a there's a point on that line where the balance of the, you know, the, the restriction stopping the stress in the joints versus quality of life and it's different for every dog now there are animals where you'd say over exercise you don't do it, it's going to shorten your dog's life however if it is one of these dogs that is just go go get them all the time you have to think then well what yeah, yeah what would the dog pick um now if it's like my my lazy whipper you can't even see because he's sleeping on the sofa I'd restrict your exercise more even stay on your lead all your life for him okay he wouldn't like it but not such a big deal if that was, yeah. say, a two-year-old Labrador or a Springer Spaniel, you think, well, it's slightly different. So maybe our point on that line is, is different. So no, we shouldn't force a dog to have a damaging intervention. But, but, but the, the point on the line that you yeah, choose I for the dog fair. does vary. So, so yes, I get, I get your point exactly. You know, we shouldn't, and, and owners worry about this a lot. This, when, when you're doing pain management, they're saying, oh, I'm just worried that I'm doing this more for me than the dog. Well, it depends what you're doing. I mean, if, I think their perception is medication is me dragging things out. Well, no one should be dragging things out. But, but if an animal is happy and, and pain-free and has a good quality of life, I don't care if they bloody rattle from the drugs they're taking. No, 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 I totally agree. Um, it so, so it is Sasha a concern. Walton. She's Who? got our dog was Sasha. on a Manstein. Yeah, our dog was on a Manstein. 
Argentine, as well as salmon oil, you move. He has had a bout of pancreatitis, so everything was stopped. We're now slowly reintroducing the drugs. Your thoughts, please. Um, just because Very we know sensible. pancreatitis is quite, quite linked uh, to salmon oils. Yeah, yeah just I, I, would, I, would, I would introduce the oils last. Mm. But you're doing a sensible thing. Yeah, the and then you, you're now going to have to balance the pancreatitis versus, you know, this is where it gets difficult because it's, it's very easy to say, do this, then do this, then do this. But then they a different condition like kidney failure. And it will vary. Um, the first thing you've done is if you have a dog who has this, this tendency, well, you've started doing things right because that's a very good multimodal uh, system and I assume that you've you kind of got there by stages and you're not just on day one said right I'll have all these things um, yeah. but yes I mean it, it, essentially if the question is should I panic am I worried no you're doing a very sensible thing and then your vet will, will help yeah. you which order to reintroduce them and when I them. say a combination of drugs they all have a place they all do a different oh, yeah. you haven't got a huge amount of overlap there so as Jamie was saying if they've been introduced in a kind of aggressive manner because of need they're needed then mm. that's fine but um, just chucking a dog onto a load of drugs on day one you don't know what's going to respond to the first drug the first drug might be adequate no. you know as I mean, say, I, I, you know, yeah. these are amazing I always say this to is just change one thing at a time. Change one thing at a time where you can. Uh, and it's the same after surgery. It's the same uh, in osteoarthritis. Is, uh, are you all right there? Have you lost me? Yes, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking, I'm looking at questions. Oh, okay. Cool. We're, so, so like, we're if, you, if you're talking about reducing a medication and introducing, reintroducing exercise, if you do them both at the same time and, and the dog goes lame again which one was the problem so so change one thing at a time and so with, with a case like that i would probably just start by reintroducing them in the same order that you introduced them in the first place the first ones yeah which is a good drug well done yes well done your vet okay, another well done you. question that we've got is um um blood um, her dog's been on loxicon for years been doing really well but blood tests last week showed the kidney levels were not so good urea was 24 we're now stopped the loxicon but what alternative is there for pain i, I know what i'd say on this one but you, you i'll let you steal the show well i think this is a very good point and again this is one where alternative um medications uh, mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a medication that maybe will have less effect on, on, on the kidneys, maybe something like galaprant. I think also, I mean, this is often a question, I know we're talking about dogs, but cats, uh, cats that have renal failure and, or, or, or not, and, and metacam is considered bad for cats, is, which is the priority. Um, you know, if you've got a dog that has fractionally raised kidney values and is in a lot of pain, clearly anti-inflammatories are the priority. If you've got a dog that mm. officially has arthritis but is completely sound and has bad kidneys, then it's the other way around. Uh, looking forward a few months, there's something for you, uh, which is there's this, uh, they're developing this uh, nerve, nerve growth factor, um, anti-nerve oh, growth factor oh. monoclonal antibody. This is coming. So essentially what this is doing is that there's this um, factor which is involved with development of, of the nervous system, but it also unfortunately has a role in uh, wind up sensitization. So what some clever people who, who are much cleverer than me, they've worked out is if you can kind of vaccinate almost the, the dog against that, you can reduce this, this, this pain effect. And the yeah. first study that, that's come out is showing that this has a similar effect in magnitude to non-steroidals. So yeah. hopefully this is going to be something very soon that's gonna have a massive impact on animals like that. Um, it's very clever. Wait, can you it's see very that? There's so much happening. There's so much happening in the OA world. It's like, oh, it's like being at the cinema and all the films are coming out at once. And um, yeah. just to add to your, um, little thing urea I, i'd be looking at the creatinine um i would also be looking at the specific gravity i'd also like look at the bigger picture yeah about i mean look at the urine kidney. as well because obviously you, you, you it's like with the vomiting and diarrhea you does not write off a perfectly yeah, good drug that's I done your dog that. so much good just on, on the basis of one blood test so yeah. make sure make sure that that we are diagnosing the, the correct thing for the correct reasons yeah, yeah absolutely think about, doing, think about doing another blood test and urine sample maybe a month's time and just see because it might be a, a blip and also is no the dog ill i mean that's another thing if it's like 
drinking loads, vomiting and lethargic and dehydrated, and that's, that's a big deal. If it's, if it's not, that's then yeah, you're deal. right, then it is look into it. So this is, this is something to discuss with your vet. Like this is where the relationship and talking to your vet is important. Um, you know, what does this mean? What, what are my options? What are you, what, what are you yeah. thinking? Um, because it's not going to be a case where they, you can look in a textbook and that number, okay, this is the answer, not this. It's going to take a little bit of a decision. Um, yes. So it's a, it's a very good question. This is why we, we do the blood tests. And if you do them regularly, you're going to find these small things where it is then a difficult decision. If you'd waited four years, suddenly have a sick dog, and then you take the kidney values and they're dreadful, you think, oh my God, we should have done this mm -hmm. earlier. So I think well done you and your vet for picking this up and have a good think about it. Um, I, yeah. I would be, like you said, be cautious about that being enough evidence to, to, to write things off. So um, mm -hmm. always, always my thing with osteoarthritis is that this is a slow growing thing is don't panic. Don't panic. Yes. Don't, 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 don't. I think, um, well, Gwen is one of our advisors, Gwen Covey Crump, and she always brings it back to a very simplistic outlook of put yourself in the position of the dog. And if the dog is in a huge amount of pain, they, they're going to want pain relief. Yes. And Excellent. I think that's really, really important is that we can get hooked up on longevity when we've got to consider what, what is the here and now. And Ian Self says something that breaks my heart every time I hear it is dogs live in the now. So we don't actually know mm. whether the pain experience is potentially worse for them because they don't have the ability to see that there could be an end to it. So yeah. I, I'm personally real passionate about getting pain under control as quickly and as effectively yes. as possible. Yes, so, I mean, that's exactly yeah. right. We know that dogs perceive time differently to us, which is why you have all this fun and games with dogs with, with you know, so excited when you've just been out to the shed and you come back the same as if you've been out all day at work um they don't see it different and, and we, we know this because when we're discussing chemotherapy protocols which i don't do because you know it's not really my area but but that's why we don't use such high doses of chemotherapy because you can't explain to the dog you know this is going to make you feel really shitty but you'll see your grandchildren yeah. at christmas you know you can't have that conversation yeah. with dogs so yes you don't want to give a medication that is going to make a current other illness worse but if you've got a choice you have to balance it you know what is the priority what would the dog say is the priority um so exactly yeah yeah and that's a great point i, I totally believe in that good question um, we're at 20 past five and because i know that i would like to talk to you again i'm going to stop here we're going to do the 10 top tips because i'm going to make you come back because you're good at oh, okay this. cool well i'm glad because it's my job <laughs> If I was bad at this, like my mum said, don't just say anything stupid. Yeah, don't go on about okay, arthritis and be do? shit at arthritis. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's okay. do the 10 top tips. I wrote, yesterday. I, I wrote some down because otherwise I think I'm just going to, I hope I don't forget something really important. Well, I've, I've got some stuff okay, written okay. down so here. So go, go number 10 and you're only allowed to talk for like one to two minutes and we're not going to tangent, I'm not going to butt in. But you're, you've got five opportunities to change someone's life. Okay, number one is don't panic. Don't panic. It's very Why? hard to explain this uh, when, you know, because we've got to give all the information. When your dog is diagnosed with osteoarthritis, we have to say this is a lifelong condition. It's progressive. Yeah. It's going to get worse. We can't cure it. And unless something ghastly happens to your animal, this is going to be the end of your animal. That's the truth. However, we yeah. don't want to give the impression that therefore all is doom and gloom and, and, and despair. And when we use things like words like palliative, that means something very specific in people's minds, which means end of life care. That's not what we mean. So the first thing is, those things are all true. However, as you've seen today, there is so much we can do. There is so much we can do that, that don't panic is the first thing. Same with any questions about, is this better? Is this worse? What should they would Don't panic. Talk about it. Look it up. Speak to your vet. Don't panic. Don't panic. Good. I love it. My number nine is start collecting information you know read and i'm terrible for um, always wanting a shortcut like if my car breaks down i want the information as quickly as possible because i'm not interested but please go to reptile resources and we'd like to think that the cam website gives you a mm. lot of information to give you a much broader understanding because if you can understand the foundations about keeping them moving keep the weight low keep them pain free as possible then everything else starts fitting into place. But if you don't understand the foundations, you just start grabbing at anything anybody offers you. Yes. And if people are offering you really, really 
a rational hope, you know, like with so much positivity, quite often they're marketing very well. So get your foundations yeah. before you start cherry picking. I, I think that's an excellent point. And you'll often find people will, will inordinately worry about things that are less important, like worry too much mm. about the, the little things and not the big things. Um, you know, talking to people who, who suffer with cancer, if you went off the um, Facebook, it would be wondering, mm. should I be eating more ginger or more blueberries to cure my cancer. Well, first thing is do your chemotherapy. Yeah. First thing is do your chemotherapy. Yeah. And this is where your, your vet is because they will be able to put these things in perspective. It's nothing wrong with you asking the question. I always say this to my clients. Don't, don't worry about asking the question. And the time to ask the question is before we make any changes. If I'm not going to be offended. If I can't justify what I'm doing, then I shouldn't be doing it. And if yeah. you ask me a question, I think, God, you know what? I don't know the answer. I prefer to find out and then tell you. Yeah. Um, and if okay, I won't, I won't offer that in the future, but usually, you know, speaking to your vet, they'll be able to put these things in perspective. Don't worry so much about the blueberries, worry more about other things. So yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Get information. No, no, the more eight. you understand it. Right. Sorry. Uh, oh, I, I, I put correct weight. Oh, good one. Good yeah. one. 100%. How can they do it? Okay. So this person hasn't got weighing scales. They live on their own. And you've just sparked them to look at their dog differently. Look at your mm. dogs differently, dudes. Don't think it's your dog. Pretend it's you your mate's know. dog. And you critique. know perfectly well. It's the same as when I see all these diet books, you know, lose weight, whatever. You know, eat the cabbage four times a day, whatever. You know, you know, when it comes to diet, you know what's good for you and what's not. You don't need some guy yeah. on Instagram to tell you that, 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 you shouldn't eat so much cake and you should eat. and you know and the same with with dogs that are overweight i mean okay there's there's changing the perception of what a dog should look like uh but okay on them with a bit of string you can take them to the vets and put them on the scales i mean come on it's raising awareness but this is not rocket science there's some very clever things we're not talking about the clever scientific things this is just yeah. bless you your dog is fat and that's bad for it and yeah. and, the and the overweight really will kill your dog sooner that's the truth. Yes. We're Thank very you. careful about saying that, but, but it will end your dog's life sooner. Whereas if you have a happier dog, there'll be less pain for longer. You'll have a happier dog longer. You'll save on dog food. It's a, it's a, it's a win-win situation. No so scroll back through Facebook, guys, because we did a lot about obesity um, only last month. So there's stuff about body condition scoring. There's a ways that you can monitor it. Number seven for me is start being objective because... Mm. All of oh, these therapies one. out there are really, really, have I pinched one? Yes. Yeah. All of these therapies out there are really exciting, but we can't promise that they're going to work for you. And I see so many people on Holly's Army that I can't imagine what their monthly bill is. And I wonder, do they need to do all that? Yes. Because if they can effectively monitor, they can see that their dog is actually doing really well. Save your money for later, because hmm. you're going to need exactly. it later. Exactly. So I, I, put, I put set goals um you know and, and measure i mean a good question that that i would like the owners to tell me in in a consult is i said it before is there anything that they can't do that they could do last time you know simple things like that mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know be specific it's not just is, is he lame is he not when is it what is there that he, he's not doing anymore um is it that he won't go under a gate on his walk is it that he won't you know, and behavioral changes and things like that. Just be specific. Yeah. And the same for vets. Same for vets. Don't write doing okay on Prevacox. Is he lame? Which leg is he lame on? How lame? Which joint? Write it down. Yes. Try and be a bit more. We've got two resources to help you guys. We've got the um, chronic pain indicator chart on the website for being more objective. We have also got the five by five by five for vets to start being able to talk to each other in a more descriptive manner about the case rather than just doing okay. We can get doing more okay. information. Yeah, dogs always do okay. And unless they're on death's door, dogs will do okay. Okay is a dangerous yeah. word. Uh, next one I had was avoid sedentary lifestyle. We talked about that. It, it's, it's correct exercise mm -hmm. planning. Whether you talk on, on this website or with your vet or with your hydrotherapist or whatever, it's just don't be sedentary. Same as, same as for people, don't sit on the couch all day. Uh, same for dogs, yeah. don't, Ludo, don't sit on the couch all day. Um, yeah. But you can have that attitude for not just exercise, but feeding. So you've got the interactive feeders, you've got hide and seek with your food. You know, just being active in the house is still activity. Yeah. Um, so think about movement, all movement counts. 
Okay, but also, this five. is a, a, another thing, actually, that this is important because dogs make the most of what they enjoy doing. And if you've got a dog that can't exercise, you've taken out half of his favorite thing. The other half of his favorite yes. thing is eating his lunch. And, and that's where, you know, what do I do now? I'm going to go and eat more lunch. Uh, and, and also we feel sorry for our dogs because they are in arthritis. So how do we, what do you do when we, do, we feel sorry for our dogs? We tend to give it a treat. So, so watch that. Go ahead. Sorry. Number five, I always say it because it is just an absolute no brainer. It's a hundred percent must is look and it's a big um a big big up for a tool that's on the website it's called hashtag it's my home to tool and mm. it helps you look at your house and make sure that your dog isn't suffering further injuries repetitive strain slips falls and making their condition worse it's no yeah. brainer it's easy to do i yeah, just you... moved into a cottage and i found lots of rugs and bits of and the floors are now covered it's not expensive to do these adaptions. No. Number four. We're not telling you to like rip out all your cool oak floor, but rubber mats, dead cheap from the bowl to the bed to the door. And it will make a big difference. You're quite right. Nice one. Make a big uh, where did I get to? Uh, yeah, teamwork, strong teamwork. This is a team game. This is not someone will tell you what to do all the time. I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll like witter on for hours and hours. But this is teamwork. This is you, the dog, the dog needs to tell you what's going on. You need to listen to the dog. You need to manage these things. And, and then the vet is involved. So if you think about it, like kind of like a football team, you know, the vet is sort of the, 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 the team director and they're going to give you all these players and whatever that the, the owner is, is the manager day to day who's performing well, who's not, you know, Love it. you're the, you're the person on the ground, take videos into your vet. You know, this is a good day. This is a bad day. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, and then they'll be able to then make the big decisions. You know, if this is not performing well, your star striker, that's your anti-inflammatories. They're the ones that are going to get the headlines. They're going to do really well for you. At the back, you've got your goalkeeper who will stop you losing. That is exercise and, and, and weight. And you need to talk to those people. So it's, it's just managing it. And hydrotherapists and everyone, nurses as well. Yeah. Yeah, and we were talking about that very briefly last night when we practiced, is that the more owners ask of their vet practices in and around the UK and around the globe, more will be provided. And yep. when we started um, four or five years ago, we were like, right, we want to up the profile. We want to, you know, to make it trendy because then practices will go, well, there's a requirement we're going to give to that requirement. So ask for it. So it leads me into number four. Oh, no, no, Don't... wait, because also, also you've missed one. Vets, vets. Have you actually met a hydrotherapist or a physiotherapist? Oh, yeah. Which one would you recommend if someone said, should I do hydrotherapy? Mm. Yeah. Go find them and, and go and have a chat because, yeah. Are they it's good? Are they not good? You don't know. You need to, you need to find yeah. out because it's not just a case of, oh, I want my dog to do hydrotherapy. I found someone on the internet. You know, you say, no, this, this is the person. They're close. They're good. Yeah. Or they're not so close, but they're yeah. better than the close people. You know, you need to give strong advice. You don't have to tell them exactly what temperature the water should be or which exercises to do, but you need to know how good are they and what is it that you want them to, to achieve? What are the goals? We're talking about setting yeah. goals. What, why are they going to hydrotherapy? It's good, but why? It's not just like go in the pool, everything will be fine. So it, it is communication. Communication. Yes. Should have written that, shouldn't I? Not teamwork. So communication. Cool. Both is about uh, making the most of what your practice can offer you so people come to us the vets you know and they just focus in on the vet within that practice i can the nurse that is desperate to be doing these cases um we have a big nurse following because they feel that we're opening the doors for them to be doing more in practice and they're brilliant they listen they advise they have more more time hopefully don't just go to the vet, see if your practice can offer you a nurse consult and don't overlook the receptionist. They're very mm. wise. Number mm. three. Uh, I've only got one. No, hang on, wait. No, no, you're uh, don't, don't, be, don't be scared of medications. Don't be scared of medications. Medications, yes. if you need them, it doesn't mean that it's the end or anything like that. If you need them, start them right away. Don't put off, you know, I, I see this with vets as well. Oh, it, it's too early to start um non-steroidals yeah. yet no 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 if he's symptomatic there is inflammation there is pain so give anti-inflammatories don't be scared of it multimodal doesn't mean you know using more than one medication does not mean it's a disaster it does not mean that you're dragging things on it means that someone is actually paying attention and doing things so medications are right. complicated uh, just because something might have potential side effects you know if it was more side yeah. effects than the benefit people it, it wouldn't exist so don't be scared of it absolutely don't be scared of it don't listen to people in the park they don't know your dog they see a lame dog they say oh it's you know it's not fair on him they don't know 
they don't know. If you and your vet yeah. think it's fair on him, it's fair. That person, off you go. Yeah. And that's a good one because you're number four, I'm number three. I love the fact that people listen to other dog walkers, other dog owners, other people in the industry. It's important that we do talk to each other. Mm. But please don't get caught up in one person's testimonial. Um, no. Please go and research it because I see so many times that people say, Mavis in the park, she gives this and it's been a game changer. Well, just have a read about it because a lot of these things are really expensive. And I know a lot of people will choose one option at the detriment of potentially another that might have more evidence. And we're going to do a, um, a big push on how to be more evidence-based, how to make decisions. And we're working on a book, the new CAM book. It's going to be all about evidence-based and why is it important to help you guys make sensible decisions. Number two. And also, my plug, uh, that's what we're doing with our expertise panel is for the vets, is giving a strong framework so they can make confident, they can give confident advice. Because vets sometimes worry about, oh my God, what if I advise this and maybe it's not, or someone's written a paper, whatever. That's our job. You know, we're going to give them guidelines so that they know they can, this is advised, this I recommend, that, you know. And who's exactly. doing this expertise? Oh, let's pick them up because they're allowed to be picked up. Who's in charge of expertise? What's this about? Uh, it was set up by a company called Vetoquinol. Um, uh -huh. Involves people much smarter than me. Uh, I think I'm there for, for comic relief. Um, but, but very serious people, you know, people who know a lot. Um, there, are, there are diplomats in, in sports medicine rehabilitation. There is the guy, Duncan Lascelles, who's probably the most inspiring okay. guy he is the guy for, for for chronic pain management and also i mean on, on another point when i was saying not be scared of medication drug companies make money out of selling drugs i make money out of being a vet you make money out of whatever job it is that you do that is not necessarily a bad thing that might not be the drive to do companies it. make money supplement and, companies and, and, you'd be amazed actually how many of these natural supplements are made by companies that belong to big drug companies. You know, it, don't, don't be put off just because someone is making some money somewhere. You know, people who run charities make money. So, so drug companies and vets are not out to trick you. They're out there to, to do the best yeah. thing that they think is, is, is correct. Do you remember so, X-Files when you were younger? Do you remember X-Files? I do. And everything was a conspiracy theory. And I go yeah. to bed at night going, I never realized that arthritis management is like X-Files. There's always a conspiracy, but there yeah, is yeah. No, and also, so, if, if there was something in your kitchen cupboard that cured after, the drug companies would not suppress it. No. They would not. Well, they, 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 would they, not. they would have had it, and they would be using it. But, yeah, um, because there are some things that they use that, that were once in people's kitchen cupboards. Um, so so yeah. they're not out to trick you. Neither are vets. We're not out to trick you. We're, we're trying to do the best thing. Number two. Was that your number two? I can't remember. Where are we at? Have you got one I don't more? know. Can I have one more? I would say. Now, uh, I would say that everything we do in osteoarthritis management is about quality of life, and that is not just your dog's quality of life. That is your quality of life. Why do we have dogs? It is to make us happy. Mm. Uh, dogs are brilliant at being happy. Now, we mustn't let them then trick us when they really should be a little unhappy, but, you know, it's there. And what we're doing is we're giving these dogs happiness and pain-free lives, so they're going to make us happy. Vets, why are you in it? It's is to make animals better. Osteoarthritis care is perhaps the one way as a vet that you're going to make the most difference, the quality of life of, of animals anywhere. I'm a surgeon. I do really, really cool things, but actually in real terms, compared to me managing osteoarthritis, I don't have that kind of impact. This is something that a new graduate can do that will save a dog's life, that will make them happy and therefore make the owner happy. It's all about happiness. I love that. So arthritis is not boring. It's extremely exciting and can- It's so cool, it's people. So up there, it is. So my last one, number one, um, Hashtag your dog more you. What just happened then? Oh, sorry. Ludo is just eating a flamingo pen. Hang on one second. Okay. So, um, hashtag your dog more years is sorry, I just, you guys I are that. helping. <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> I know he's a bad boy. Um, who's that? Blimey. Is that your yeah. pen? That's more worrying. Uh, you know, no, that, that's not my like signing bank accounts pen. That's, that's Gracie's pen, my daughter. Promise. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so the final one, guys, is that 
this isn't a secret. This is to be shared. You need to help other people because there's nothing more heartbreaking than seeing somebody who loves their dog walking it down the road and they're dragging them two, three, three feet behind. They don't know that they have got options. They don't know that they've got a problem. They just think mm. that their dog's getting old. Stop keeping it a secret. To hand a business card, a flyer, pass on the website, the Facebook, mention the hashtag, get out there and help other people because I know that I wish I'd known more than I do now. I wish sooner in Holly's life I'd. She did some weird things. She had a nerve root signature when she was probably about three or four years old, and it was such an intermittent um, right for lameness. And I just wish I knew more then, you know, and she had a noise phobia that started when she was probably about five, six years old, but her lumbosacral disease wasn't really picked up until she was about 11, 12. I wish I'd known more. Yeah. And we can help other people by talking about this. So make it trendy and let's get talking. Thank you, Jamie. I am so grateful. Um, Thanks for watching, back? people. Yeah, Would of you course. come back and do more? Of course. Ace. So if you've enjoyed fun. this, guys, Please say this was really helpful and then it's more persuasion for me to get Jamie, who's really, really busy, to come back and do more. And Until send then, questions. Thanks. What you want to talk about, not what I want to talk about. Send questions. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, get your questions below and then I'll post them to him and we'll get him back maybe even before Christmas if we're lucky. Oh my God, okay, I'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, shortly after Christmas. Cool, sure. right. See you later, guys. All right, bye.